Okay, I see there's a half an hour break after my talk. I promise I won't run into the extra time. Um, my name is Ying from Rice University, and hopefully by the end of my talk today, I can give you some idea uh, as to the optical properties of gold silica gold multilayer nanoshells. I'll demonstrate to you some simulation results uh, by using me theory for concentric multilayer nanoshells and using finite element methods to look at offset multilayer nanoshells. Um, at the same time, I hope you can also gain some fundamental physics insight as to why this particle has such properties by using a very easy and intuitive physics model. I'd like to first start by uh, talking to you a little bit about the big picture as to why we're interested in uh, gold-based nanoparticles. Uh, this video is made by Nanospectra. It's a startup company from Rice. Uh, the company is specializing, uh, is commercializing the use of nanoshells for cancer treatment. The basic idea is we fabricate gold-based nanoshells that are biocompatible. They also have very strong absorption in the near-infrared range. We inject these nanoshells into a cancer patient and they circulate in the blood vessels and because of the leaky nature of the tumor vasculature, the particles can actually penetrate the blood vessel and accumulate on the tumor site. The particles that are not accumulated on the tumor site are eventually removed by the liver and spleen of our body. So after the tumor is loaded with, uh, with nanoparticles, we insert an optical fiber into the tumor mass and deliver near-infrared light. Because of the strong absorption of these nanoparticles in the near-infrared region, uh, they can basically heat up and burn and kill the cancer cells without harming the normal, healthy surrounding tissue. So the particle, you may ask that why we're interested in near-infrared light. And if you look at this plot here, the horizontal axis is the wavelength, and the vertical axis plots the absorption of different components in a typical biological tissue. For instance, water and hemoglobin protein, which is a major component for red blood cell, absorbs minimal in a range between 700 nanometers and 900 nanometers, and we call this the near-infrared imaging window. And the particle that uh, nanospectra is using is, uh, is called a uh, silica gold core shell nanoshell. It's basically made of a glass core coated with a very thin layer of gold on the outside. The overall size of the nanoshell is on the order of 100 nanometers to over 300 nanometers, so it's smaller compared to a typical cell, which is a few microns. Now, it turns out these nanoshells have very interesting optical properties. So if you look at the optical spectrum for nanoshells here, it turns out that they can have different uh, resonances at, at different uh, wavelengths depending on the geometry of the nanoparticle. For instance, if we're shrinking the size of the outer gold shell, we can basically shift this resonance uh, towards longer wavelength, and we call this red shift. And that's very nice that it gives us a way to tune these nanoparticles to resonate and absorb very strongly in the near-infrared window, which overlaps with the minimal absorption from biological tissue. This allows us to use this nanoparticle as exogenous agents for cancer treatment. So there are a couple of desired properties for nanoshells. Of course, we like them to have near-infrared resonances. And, and also, we like them to be small, preferably smaller than 100 nanometers. And the reason for that is that particles larger than 100 nanometers do not penetrate the blood vessel very effectively, and that will result in low targeting efficiency. Now come with the properties or the challenges. It turns out it's very difficult to make these near-infrared nanoshells that are smaller than 100 nanometers. And the reason for that is if you look at the spectrum here, uh, in order to have near-infrared nanoshells, we desire the thickness of the gold shell to be on the order of 10 nanometers or lower. And based on the protocols available to us at the time, it is very difficult to make continuous and smooth gold shell of that thickness. So a question I ask myself is, can we tune optical properties not just from the outside gold shell, but by adding additional layers to the inside of the particle? And we need computational models to provide further insight. And that brings to me theory for concentric spheres. And I'm not going into the details of me theory. Uh, it's been around for a long time. It's used to solve the light scattering of light from spherical objects. And me theory is conventionally used for solid spheres or core shell two-layer structures. And here I took me theory and extended it so my code can compute light scattering from uh, spherical objects with arbitrary number of layers. So by applying me theory code, uh, I directly looked at the optical properties of a gold silica gold multilayer nanoshell. The only difference between this particle and the nanoshell I mentioned on the previous slide 
is I added a gold core to the center of a conventional nano shell. I want to compare the optical properties of a multilayer nano shell to that of a conventional nano shell. I also like to introduce a physics model that helps us, un helps us understand the tunability of a multilayer nano shell. Um, let's start with the plasma hybridization theory. Uh, let me give you some background on uh, surface plasmas. When we direct light onto an interface between a metal and a dielectric, a dielectric material, um, under the right circumstances, this light wave can actually induce a resonant interaction between the light waves and the free electrons in the metal. In other words, the oscillation of electrons in the metal matches with the oscillations of the electromagnetic waves outside the metal, and the result is the production of surface plasma. If you wrap this surface around to form a sphere, we have localized surface plasmas. Now for a silica gold core shell nano shell, there are two interfaces that can support surface plasmas. The one on the outside uh, gold surface, we call it the sphere mode. The one on the inside, we call it the cavity mode. The interaction between these two surface plasmas gives rise to two modes for the nano shell, the high energy anti-bonding mode and the low energy bonding mode. What we see in the optical spectrum for nano shells here actually corresponds to the low energy bonding mode. For the notation here, R4070 means that this nano shell has an inner radius of 40 nanometers and an outer radius of 70 nanometers. So the strength of interaction between these two modes is determined by how far apart they're separated from each other, and that's related to the thickness of the gold shell. If we're reducing the thickness of the gold shell, we're bringing these two modes closer to each other. That will result in a further split apart of the anti-bonding mode and the bonding mode which means the downshift of the bonding mode in energy, which correlates to redshift of the plasma resonance in the spectrum we see for the nano shell. We can use the same model to understand, to predict the optical properties of multilayer nano shells compared to a conventional nano shell. Uh, we can think of it as an interaction between the bonding mode of a conventional shell interacting with, with the core mode we added to the particle. Now the interaction between these two modes will result in two new modes for the multilayer nano shell, namely the high energy anti-bonding mode and the low energy bonding mode. The strength of interaction between these two modes now is determined by the thickness of the silica layer. So here shows some me calculations for the optical spectrum of a conventional nano shell in black and multilayer nano shells in color. The notation here R253050 means that my multilayer nano shell has an inner radius of 25 nanometers, intermediate radius of 30 nanometers, and outer radius of 50 nanometers. So the overall size of the particle is 100 nanometers. The animation here shows that when I'm keeping the, mid, the intermediate and outer radius the same, while I'm gradually increasing the size of the gold core, you can see how uh, this bonding mode of a conventional nano shell split out into the two anti-bonding and bonding mode I mentioned on the previous slide. And, and as I'm increasing the size of the gold core, I'm gradually decreasing the thickness of the silica layer, and I'm redshifting this low energy bonding mode. And all of these are consistent with the hybridization model I just talked about. So again, we can see here that we can redshift the resonance from a conventional nano shell to the near infrared region without changing the thickness of the gold shell. So if we extract one particular spectrum here, Again, we can see the anti-bonding mode and the bonding mode for this multilayer nano shell. I can apply Gauss law to extract the surface charge distributions on each interface that can support a surface plasma. So without going into the details, uh, one point I want to make here is that for both modes, you can see the dipolar nature of these modes. Uh, uh, this will be brought up again for an offset multilayer nano shell, where we actually see more complex nature for the resonant modes. So we actually attempted to make these nanoparticles. We started with a gold colloid. We coated a very thin layer of silica on the surface. And then we coated the final gold layer using the same protocol we used for conventional nano shells. Uh, this paper done by another group at Rice completed this study. Uh, they basically confirmed that multilayer nano shells have dual plasma resonances, and they can redshift the plasma resonance from that of a conventional nano shell. Um, from the TEM images here, uh, the scale bar is 100 nanometers. Uh, you can observe some surface, uh, you can observe some shape irregularities. The first type is uh, morphological defects. By morphological defects, mainly I mean surface roughness. Uh, they're not smooth around the surface uh, as opposed to a perfect sphere in the Mi model. Um, 
and surface roughness has been known to affect both the spectral property as well as the angular radiation property for conventional nanoshell. The second type of irregularity is eccentricity. So what happens if one surface is offset from the center as with respect to the other surfaces? And this has been looked at for conventional nanoshell as well. So a question, a natural question to ask is, what will happen to the optical properties of a multilayer nanoshell if I offset the surface from the center? So here I did a simple case where I basically offset the center core away from the center. Um, and then I use the finite element method to look at the symmetry breaking effect. To start with the hybridization model, uh, in a concentric case, I have a dipole of the shell interacts with a dipole of the core, which results in the two dipole modes I mentioned to you with the surface charge distributions, if you still remember. The quadruple mode interacts with the quadruple mode of the core, and that produces quadruple modes. And the reason we do not see quadruple modes is because they're highly damped uh, in our concentric case. In the offset case, however, the mode selection rule is relaxed. So now modes of different orders can start to interact. For instance, the dipole mode of the core can now interact with the quadruple mode of the shell. And what that does is it, it injects a dipole moment into the quadruple mode. And because of the amplitude of the plasma resonance is directly proportional to the dipole moment, and, and this mixed interaction will actually result in the excitation of the higher order modes that are previously dark in the concentric spectrum. So here is, are just uh, FEM calculations showing the spectrum of a, con a concentric multilayer nanoshell in black and uh, offset multilayer nanoshell in color. I basically offset the core with delta X. If we just look at one spectrum here uh, with nine nanometer offset, again, uh, I can apply the Gauss law to examine the surface charge distributions at each interface that supports the surface plasma. And you can make out that these are indeed the quadruple mode and octuple mode. You can see better that the quadruple mode has two alternating layers stacking from the top to the bottom of the particle, and similarly with the octuple modes. Now, there are a couple observations we can make. First of all, we can actually see dipole characteristic in these higher order modes. Uh, in particular, if you look at the quadruple mode here, the 2D mode, a, per a perfect quadruple would, like, would look like what's in the block here. It will have an evenly spaced out full quadrant and the overall dipole is going to be zero, it's not going to be excited. And the reason we see this charge distribution skewed towards the top is because now there's a mixture of the dipole into the quadruple. In this simple illustration here, if I add two parts of the dipole into one part of a quadruple and overlay them, and, and the end result is exactly what you see at the 2D mode, you see the majority of it being the dipole, but you can still make out the feature on the top, which denotes is a quadruple mode. The same can be said for the octuple mode, and at the same time, we can see a higher order mode characteristic in the dipole mode, so it's losing in amplitude. So back to the very first question I asked in the beginning, can we use multilayer nanoshells for our cancer treatment? And first of all, what's the practical implication of the symmetry breaking effect? And I think it's probably only observable in single particle measurements, because when we use these nanoshells for uh, our applications, the concentration of nanoparticles is usually on the order of 10 to the 10 particles per mil. And when you have that ensemble, part, not, uh, not that number of particles, you're measuring an average uh, spectrum, which I highly suspect you will actually see the higher order modes. I think it is a feasible particle to be used for absorption-based photothermal therapy for cancer treatment. Uh, one thing, if you remember in, in my uh, animation, when I redshift my low energy bonding mode, it's also losing in amplitude because uh, because it's giving more amplitude to the anti-bonding mode. And I think given enough particle concentrations, it can make up that uh, amplitude and have the same uh, absorption efficiency as the con conventional nanoshell. I think it can be used for biosensing, and I just want to mention that there are other types of nanoparticles I'm aware with that came uh, when we studied the multilayer nanoshells, just to name a few, gold, gold sulfide nanoshells, hollow nanoshells, nano cages, nanostars. But I think the presentation I gave here today uh, will give us a, a computational tool which we can use to uh, predict the optical properties of these nanostructures, as well as to have a physics model that can give us some insight as to why they can have such properties. So to conclude, I showed you a meat code for multilayer spheres. I used it to examine the optical properties of concentric multilayer nanoshells. I used a hybridization model to predict that a multilayer nanoshell can redshift the resonance from a conventional nanoshell. And I extended study, I used the finite element method to look at the offset multilayer nanoshell 
I showed you that uh, higher order modes can be excited in the offset case because of the mixed interaction between modes of different orders. So it's all good. We're now all experts of nanophotonics. But I have one last slide. What can nanophotonics do for HPC? Um, I came up with this slide because of the keynote speech yesterday where we talk about building exascale computing resource and we need one billion processors and the astronomical amount of power we need to deliver to the processors. Um, and um, I was just thinking maybe nanophotonics can do something for the next generation HPC. And it turned out if you look into the literature, there are a number of circuit elements built of plasmonic devices that have been uh, conceptualized and published in papers. Uh, in particular, uh, there is the plasmonic waveguide and plasmonic transistors termed plasmonsters. Um, and, and if I just give it some naive guesses, uh, the common trait of these structures uh, is that they both use photons instead of electrons. If you look at the near-infrared light we use at 750 nanometers, the frequency is 400,000 gigahertz. I'm not proposing this as the clock speed for the new uh, HPC, but I think it definitely has the potential uh, uh, to be the next generation uh, computing uh, structure. And, and another property, if you remember, the surface plasma resonance is basically an oscillation of electron uh, along the metal surface. It's not propagating along the surface. It's basically the photon that's propagating, and it's immune to resistance and capacitance, and that can suggest an ultra-fast data transfer rate compared to uh, the traditional uh, interconnect we have. Um, um, I'm not avoiding the challenges of using plasmonic devices uh, to generate integrated plasmonic devices. I think one challenge would be the ohmic heating uh, that this oscillation will induce on the metal surface. The same heating we use to kill the cancer cells can melt your CPU. So that's one challenge. The other challenge, I think, is how we integrate these uh, plasmonic devices into one chip. Uh, it's going to be a, a very difficult. But I think it does provide, it might be a sensible upgrade uh, from the traditional silicon-based semiconductors we're familiar with. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone's attention. I'd like to especially thank Krell. I still remember when I was uh, standing in the new fellows dinner and giving an introduction about myself, and now I'm a graduating fellow through two practicums and made numerous friendships and, and, and met collaborators and national labs that both influenced my graduate study as well as my postgraduate career. So thank you. With that, I'd like to answer any questions if you have. <laughs>